Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you guys are having a good day and I hope if you're watching this after Christmas, which I think you are according to my upload schedule, I hope you had a fantastic Christmas. If you celebrate it, I hope you had a lovely Wednesday. If not, we are back here in the Minecraft Survival Guide world and of course, after losing a bunch of my gear at the end of the last episode, I've gone ahead and done a bit of villager trading and a little bit of enchanting just to get my supplies back up to where they were. And it really wasn't all that difficult. The only thing I have left to make is my shield. I need to remake one of those and I'm going to just do that quickly on camera with you guys. I actually have a copy of the shield right here and I think all we should need to do is stick this in uh, the crafting interface with another shield and I think it copies the design over but if not we can remake the banner. A while ago I made a video about what to do when you die and so that felt kind of relevant to my recent experience fighting the wither and getting all of my stuff destroyed. Ultimately it just comes down to prepare before hand. Let's see if that copies. No, it doesn't. Okay, fair enough. I could repair this shield, but I might just craft a new one. So I have a skull charge banner pattern in here. All I should need to do is grab a little bit of black wool out of here with which to make a new banner and some white dye with bone meal that I can use to make the white skull pattern on top. Let's see if we have any in there. We don't. Okay, it's, I've been using a lot of bone meal lately. I wonder if I've got any dye up here in the farmhouse in the dye chest. Yes, okay, we have some white dye in there. Perfect. All right, now we can go over to the loom. We can assemble this pattern, a white skull charge, and then all I need to do is combine that with a shield in my inventory to get myself the skull charge shield back. Oh, that feels good. Feels like uh, my arm is complete again. Now I just need to grab, oh, I have mending books up in here. That's a good start. Let's grab one of those and let's find an unbreaking book. I did get a bunch of those from my villagers over at the trading hall recently and thankfully I have a ton of emeralds and books stockpiled. There we go, got an unbreaking book in this supply chest up here and we can combine the two of these books in an anvil like so and then combine that with the shield which is now in my offhand, put that back together, and all of my gear is pretty much complete. So what we have is Smooth Operator the second. Oh, sad to lose that Silk Touch pick, but luckily I had one in reserve as well. I have made a new Fortune 3 pickaxe, which I have nicknamed Misfortune. <laughs> kind of felt relevant, I suppose. I've got a Sharpness 5 Looting 3 sword. I feel like that will do me for the foreseeable future. I can always add a knockback to that if I really want knockback, and Sweeping Edge is going to be essential for that as well. Uh, I have the Mushroom Chopper 2, which now has sharpness as well as silk touch and a silk touch shovel. That combined with the rest of the armor and stuff, it's going to be fine. And I did lose most of the armor that I have, which includes all of the different protection types, which of course we can no longer get as of Minecraft 1.15 because it was only possible to stack protections like that in Minecraft 1.14. However, the saving grace of this whole thing is that I wasn't wearing my chest plate at the time, so I still have a diamond chest plate with all of the stacking protections. It's not been possible to stack all of those since 114.3 came out, and so I'm just going to keep that in there as a reminder that that was ever possible, but for now we are back to using standard gear. And I suppose that's okay because People were always asking me how I was able to do it, and I had to explain that it wasn't really possible to do it in the most recent version of Minecraft, so now it feels like I'm back on a level playing field with everyone who's watching the series. But today's episode is going to be all about what to do with all of this honey. Now we have been farming honey blocks for a little while, I'm able to use them decoratively all over the place, and in here we have a whole bunch of honey bottles, and I've been storing the uh, empty bottles in here as we go as well. I need to put some of those back into the hive, and people did suggest a bunch of ways that that could be, like, all of the glass bottles could be recycled back into the hive using hopper minecarts and that kind of stuff. For now, I'm just going to pop these in here, and we can always use those at a later date. But these honey blocks are really going to be the focus of today's episode. I want to do a lot of stuff with them, and it is possible to do a lot of stuff with them. Some people have been questioning exactly what makes honey blocks so interesting, and today I'm going to show you. So the thing that makes honey blocks spectacular and interesting is how they interact with redstone stuff, specifically pistons, because moving honey blocks around has some really interesting effects. And today we're going to look into a bunch of these and how honey blocks are about to revolutionize things like piston doors. People have already been experimenting with these mechanics in the snapshot versions of Minecraft. And let me tell you, there is some exciting stuff going on here. I wonder if I have some cobblestone handy. Yes, I do. Okay, so I can make 
make levers. We've got stone buttons here as well. Very good. All right, I need to make a couple of levers for this so that we have some components we can use to activate and deactivate pistons. And we'll start off over here. Honey blocks are kind of similar to slime blocks in that if you attach blocks to them, then they will move stuff around, kind of similar to slime blocks like that. So if you place a lever down in a spot that doesn't have grass on it, so it will actually place the lever there, you'll notice that this is moving the cobblestone block with it, kind of similar to the way a slime block does. So right off the bat, it's effectively another slime block. And that's not the only thing. There are really interesting interactions or lack of interactions between honey blocks and slime blocks, which are going to be crucial to what we're doing a little bit later. But not only does the honey block drag other blocks with it when attached, it will also drag item entities which are dropped on top of the honey block. See where this lever is here? It's actually moving the item entity along with the honey block, which is something that slime blocks do not do. Let me give you a quick example here using a slime block. We'll do exactly the same thing. I'll place a slime block on there. We're going to throw a lever down on top of it like so. A lever is not the best example item, but it's just what I've got handy. And now if I move that, you'll see that the lever stays in the same place. In fact, if the lever were a little bit further over, let's do this with a golden carrot instead. That's on top of the piston. Let's throw it down on the edge of the slime block there. I push that and the golden carrot actually falls through the empty spaces of the piston head. So that will not happen with a honey block. A honey block will actually bring the item with it. And with a little bit of applied redstone, this could actually make a sort of item conveyor belt. If you imagine making, I don't know, a sushi restaurant, for example, where items move around on conveyor belts and people can just pick Pick up whatever they want from the conveyor belt. You could do something like that with honey blocks if you wanted to. That would take a little bit of engineering though, because one interesting thing about honey blocks that makes them different from slime blocks once again is that they do not conduct redstone power. For example, here I'll place a redstone torch down there. Let me grab a lamp here as well, and then we'll add a slime block on top of this redstone torch, pop a lamp on there and you'll see the lamp lights up immediately. That's being lit by the redstone power source because the redstone torch is powering the slime block from below, which is powering the redstone lamp here at the same time. Now, if we place a honey block here instead, you'll notice the same does not happen. Honey blocks are not capable of transferring redstone power. They technically don't count as solid blocks in the same way that slime blocks do. And so that makes them a little bit tricky to do things like conveyor belts with because a lot of conveyor belts, a lot of piston feed tapes rely on either a redstone clock running in the background or the block itself being powered from below. Take the slime block here as an example. If we set up something like a zero tick uh, setup here where we have a block on the side, let's say there. If we place a piston over the top here, we'll replace that redstone dust and there you go. That creates the zero tick pulse that allows the piston to push the slime block off of it and leave it there permanently. You can't do the same thing with a honey block because the honey block is not conducting that redstone torch power so the sticky piston is not able to push it along. You would need something else powering this, meaning we would have to construct this feed tape a little bit differently. You can run it off a redstone clock, you can do a variety of different things with it, but it's going to take a little bit of engineering, some stuff that we haven't done in the series before in order to make a honey block feed tape that's actually pushing these things around. Now in much the same way that you can place multiple slime blocks and have them be pushed in formation, you can do the same thing with honey blocks as well. So really, in terms of how they interact with pistons, they are pretty much exactly the same as slime blocks. But there's some really cool stuff going on with honey blocks and slime blocks not being able to connect to each other because if we put some slime blocks on the side here, slime blocks are an exception to the blocks that honey blocks will drag with them. So you can actually separate mechanisms that involve both honey blocks and slime blocks, which will lead to some really interesting stuff we're going to explore a little bit later. But we can have that one move independently and we can have this one move independently as well, which is going to mean that we can create some really spectacular piston doors. Before we get too far away from it though, honey blocks don't just move blocks and items, they will also move players and mobs, in fact. So like when you're standing on a set of honey blocks, unlike slime blocks where you would stay in the same place unless you were being pushed by one end of a slime block, 
horizontally, honey blocks will actually drag the player or some sort of mob around. So let's make ourselves a honey block slime block flying machine over here. And we'll need to clear out a little bit of the terrain underneath here. Now, we can't make a flying machine in the same way that we can make some of the slime block based flying machines because we cannot have the redstone power be conducted by the blocks themselves. And it, normally when we make flying machines like this, I would end up making a, uh, an observer face downwards into the slime block here, sort of attached to this block facing downwards. That's not going to power the pistons in this setup because the honey block itself is not going to be able to conduct redstone power. However, in Java edition at least, the observers can actually power pistons like this. You can actually have a, uh, a redstone output here power this piston diagonally. And if I place the observers like so, we should be able to activate, I think, this observer here. If I do something to activate that, let me place a block here. If I stand on this arm of the, uh, the honey blocks here, if I place a block there, now we have a flying machine that we can actually stand on and be pushed around. Unlike the slime block one where we'd have to be sat in a boat or something like that, a player can simply stand on a honey block flying machine and be transported by it. Now, I haven't had much of a chance to use this on mobs yet, but the potential for this to be used in mob transport is frankly kind of interesting. So I think we will try our best to move, let's say this cow. I brought a lead with me so that we can move this cow around using it. And I think we're gonna try getting this cow onto a honey block flying machine and sending it on a quick flight over the swamp here. Now, when I step onto a honey block, you will notice if I go to the F3 screen that this is not a full block. We are actually down one small percentage of a block in height and as such it not being a solid block mobs will try not to walk on top of it mobs will typically avoid walking on non-solid blocks where they can and honey blocks are no exception to that however by using a lead we can guide the cow out onto this arm of the honey block flying machine and hopefully we should be able to set up the flying machine components behind it it might try and walk off here onto solid ground but mobs also act a little bit weirdly when they are on top of these things so maybe if we just give it a nudge it won't just walk straight off the edge onto the grass below so i don't have a whole lot of control over what the cow is about to do but if we send it off on its journey like so there you go it's staying on top of the honey blocks in the flying machine obviously it's butting against the observer there a little bit and is probably still trying to pathfind around i have a feeling that if it ends up walking over the top of the observer at any point then it would probably fall off the flying machine let me try and follow it uh here using Using my elytra yet the cow is staying on there for a good distance of the journey though which is is actually quite promising i have a feeling it's trying to pathfind onto one of those observers but it's probably having to reset its pathfinding every time the block underneath it moves so as long as you can get the animals on there in the first place this might actually be quite an effective way of transporting stuff and once it reaches a large area of terrain here there you go it's run out of blocks to push and it's going to come to a complete stop welcome to your new home cow you have <laughs> successfully managed to cross that river well done so as an addendum to that it's worth noting that honey blocks do not change what you can push or pull with a piston unfortunately there is no way of pushing anything more than 12 blocks with a piston and once you reach a total of 13 blocks attached to a piston it will basically just give up and not be able to push it anymore there you go see if i take a couple of blocks out of this it's going to be able to push that no problem and there you go you saw the honey blocks actually stayed on top of the other honey blocks here as soon as you add more than that though it's not going to be able to push and pull it anymore we've already covered some of the other properties of honey blocks such as the ability to limit players jump height and slide down the side of them to achieve a safe landing but now it's time to really dive into what they can do when it comes to interacting or not interacting with slime blocks in piston doors. So after the break, we're going to build a couple of example piston doors and I'll show you what we've been missing this entire time. Hey folks, welcome back and welcome to the pillars. This is an area that I haven't really explored all that much on camera. I've been doing a lot of work on these on streams, or at least I did a while ago. I haven't done any for a little while. My idea for this area was simply to be an area that kind of added background scenery to the world without really having any kind of significance. I was just building up these pillars made out of stone and stone brick and so forth. And I think they're kind of nice as background detail, occasional little quartz sections on top and things like that. 
And I always thought that if I was going to introduce this into the lore of the world, I would call it something like an abandoned dwarven base with these sort of giant columns everywhere and high up walkways, but really a lot of the stuff would be hidden in secret down below here. And sort of what I want to do for this section is design a piston door that would break apart an area of the mountainside around here and use that as a secret entrance into whatever halls the dwarves had carved out. So I'm going to do that over here with this area and I think this is going to be a nice place to set up a kind of fake hillside that opens out into something that we can create a more interesting piston door in here. So the key to the circuit we're about to make is a piston double extender. Obviously a single piston extension is simply a piston getting activated and it will push the block in front of it uh, forward one block. Now of course, if you attach an observer to a piston and you have it pulsed once, it's only sending out a one tick pulse into the piston, which in Java edition has the ability to displace the block in front of the piston head, meaning it doesn't stay stuck to the piston head when it retracts. And this is really, really useful for various redstone circuits. What we're going to be making is a piston double extender, which will for a start push this piston off the front of the piston head like so, so that it gets separated and then extend this piston, allowing allowing it to push another block, another block over like this. Hang on one second while I set this up, bam. And so the block ends up there. Instead of only getting pushed one block, it gets pushed two blocks. And that's going to allow us to set up a bunch of interesting stuff with slime block doors. Now, the cool way of setting up a piston double extender is to have two observers facing this way yeah facing this way like so stacked on top of two sticky pistons and in order to show you what this does i've got my input block here which has a redstone component on top of it this can be redstone dust as long as it's powered directly from the side of this block but in this case we're just going to use a button and we've got these two observers laid out on top here and two sticky pistons underneath what we're going to do is press the button here and you'll notice that both pistons extend and then retract again. But once this one comes back into place, it fires one more time. And that is essential for retracting this block again because that piston needs to pick the block up a second time and drag it back in towards itself. This is a very, very simple piston double extender circuit that will work in Java edition. Unfortunately, I think the diagonal powering aspect here does not work in bedrock edition, so you're gonna need to find another solution for that. But one of the coolest parts about this double extender circuit is that you can stack them up basically on top of themselves. Obviously, you're leaving one block gap in between, but that's gonna be ideal for the type of door we want to make. And all we'll need to do is create a tower up the side here using glass like that and we can remove that bottom layer there and then if we place redstone dust here here and here i'm using red glass to demonstrate that there is redstone dust on top of those because you can't see it through the texture there but that is a redstone tower that's leading up to that second set of observers and then when you power this block which i'm going to do using this button here you'll be able to power that redstone dust and it's going to travel up and activate both of those in unison. So what we end up with, if we add, let's say, some yellow concrete to the side here, is we'll end up with both of those getting pushed over. Now, obviously, when we retract this, it's only going to retract that first block of yellow concrete because the yellow concrete isn't completely attached to the rest of the yellow concrete. That is where honey blocks and slime blocks come in. By setting up three honey blocks attached to each of these, like so, we can actually create a door that moves the components in front of it. Let's use the yellow concrete. Did I put that back in here? I did. Let's put the yellow concrete on the front of these, like so, and the honey blocks will now extend two blocks out this way, and then we'll be able to be retracted two blocks that way because they stick to each other and they stick to the materials that are on the front faces of them. So we can have them extend, like so, and then retract them again, like so. So they move two blocks backwards each time. Using another setup like this, but with slime blocks instead of honey blocks, we will actually be able to create a full door that's going to appear in the cliff face here. So when they are extended, we want the slime blocks to go on the inside of the honey blocks here. Let me pillar up with some more slime blocks, place three across the top. Watch what happens now when I retract the honey blocks. These two sticky substances do not get pulled and pushed by each other and that's going to allow us to set up an identical set of 
uh, piston double extenders on the opposite side here. Of course, the slime blocks are one block higher than the honey blocks, so we want to set up the piston double extenders one block higher as well. So I'll just need to do a little bit of setup over here, placing the pistons facing this way and the observers facing inwards like so. And then all we'll need to do is build up another tower similar to the one we have over here and connect the two via button. I'm going to temporarily steal the button from this side to check that this activates okay. Yep, that's retracted the slime blocks totally fine. And now, of course, we can place our concrete blocks in here. Now let me grab the button from here and we'll connect these two with a fairly rudimentary line of redstone dust. Obviously we would want to conceal this and we will conceal it in the final design here, but all we need to do is run a redstone current directly into these two red blocks, which are the base of our redstone tower here. And let's line this up uh, nice and simply in front like this so that we have a button here and then we can connect that up to the repeater on this side as well. Now all I have to do is place the button in the middle, activate both of those at once and they form a solid wall. With this, this could be stone, this could be any material you like, but as soon as you activate the double extenders they leave a gap that the player can walk through. And given the minimal amount of blocks that are attached to the honey blocks here, remember we are focusing on what this piston here can push, it is also possible to line these on the opposite side with materials so that you wouldn't be able to see the door if you closed it from the opposite side as well. Of course, you'd have to have some sort of mechanism that would activate that, otherwise you're going to get crushed trying to activate this button on this side. But this is a very simple one wide piston double extender circuit that we can conceal artfully inside the mountain here and with a simple press of a button attached to one of these pillars we'll be able to activate the door and allow it to come out of the rock face over here. So I'm going to go get some sleep and we're going to build it in the mountainside. Hey folks, welcome back. So I've done a little bit of set dressing around here and it might look like an unassuming cliffside give or take a couple of the details I've added which of course you could leave out if you wanted this base to be completely concealed but now with a single press of this button over here the cliffside parts to reveal a pretty cool looking entrance into your base where I've apparently thrown a bunch of stone on the floor. I've left this backside undecorated so that you can see what's going on here but it's effectively the same thing as we had out in the demonstration area just with an additional row of slime blocks and honey blocks stacked one on top of each other sort of side by side here when we press this button once again the whole thing collapses inwards and you end up with a solid wall which of course we could just put a bunch of stone blocks on the front here to decorate that and then when we press the button again those are going to get dragged out and it's exactly the same on the inside as it is on the outside you kind of need a three block wide space to build a door like this and of course you will need some sort of un movable block along the bottom here unless you want to carve that out but of course that makes it a little bit less pleasant to walk over i'm just using droppers for that you can use droppers furnaces anything that's unmovable by slime blocks or pistons obsidian would work just as well you know the stuff and the coolest part about this is it's a very neat looking piston door but the redstone behind it is remarkably simple and i think it's gonna be kind of cool to experiment with the ways we can have honey blocks and slime blocks overlap each other in redstone mechanisms that could lead to some really really interesting doors like this. For the last thing we're doing today I kind of want to build one more redstone door and that's going to be underneath the castle itself. Because one thing I've wanted to do for a while is set up some kind of door over here which leads to a room that's going to have an auto smelter that will smelt everything we put into it in the most efficient way. So for example we could have a section that filters out things like food to go into smokers, iron ore and gold ore to go into blast furnaces and everything else would go into regular furnaces. For that I kind of wanted to use this space and so we're going to have a little walkway here that's going to lead downwards into another area and I want to make a big piston door in front of that. So for that I want to dig out a large area over here and what we're going to have is a little walkway here that leads down to a four block wide piston door that's going to use double extenders that meet in the middle instead of overlapping allowing the door itself to be pretty wide and I've already designed this one in a creative test world and I think it looks really great so I'm going to go ahead and build it I will leave the back half of the redstone uncovered once again so you guys will be able to see what's happening but it's another really neat way of figuring out how slime blocks and honey blocks can interact without messing with each other too much. All right, folks, I think you're going to like this. So down here at the bottom of this extra staircase I just added under here in the, the undercroft of the castle, we have this enormous edifice over here. And with a simple press of this button here, 
the whole thing opens up very, very quickly. Not only that, but it closes even quicker. And making a piston door this large would have been so, so difficult for me previously. And now it is kind of a cinch. It's really, really easy to make. Now, the fun thing about this, let me show you, by the way, let me show you what happens if you try and build this entire thing with slime blocks, because <laughs> this is this is why honey blocks are so important. If we put these two together, that's absolutely fine. But if we try and open it again, it tries to pull the entire thing over this way, and we end up with a very different design of door. If we had a larger area of slime blocks here, the pistons would not be able to pull them one way or the other with the amount of material that is hanging on. I'm quite surprised that that even worked with all slime blocks. But with honey blocks, it is simple enough to have a separating door so that the honey and the slime do not stick to each other. None of the materials around them do and they simply split apart. And this circuit here is just the same piston double extender we made before, except we have spaced these two blocks apart and used two blocks with each of the slime block areas and the honey block areas to each side so that when they come together in the middle it's a four block wide door and they meet in the middle instead of interlocking like the previous design did and that's really it aside from that it's just set dressing it's just a couple of pillars around the outside stuff to conceal the redstone and these trap doors up the edge here which conceal the fact that behind there is just an empty space with a honey block in it i am really really happy with this design i think it turned out beautifully i love how quickly it closes and how large an area Area this covers and this is the type of thing I mean when you add in stuff like honey blocks to the game some new stuff becomes a little bit easier to do and it's just an excuse to explore mechanics like this that may have been intimidating to you in the past I have never really messed with piston doors all that much I've made one of them in this series before and even that was not exactly the best thing you've ever seen this however is something that I can be really quite proud of. And behind here, of course, we can hollow out a huge area to build the biggest auto smelter we're going to be building in the series. We're not going to be doing that for a while, though, because I have many other projects that I want to take on. In the meantime, we have many other auto smelters that we can use. But for now, I think that is going to be it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like on the video. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.